Je ne
Come 
Honourable members. Honourable members, may all of us please get settled. Your guest of honour has arrived, so he will be coming to the chamber shortly. Kindly get settled so that we invite him to join you. Wherever you are, if you are standing, please get seated. Get seated, everybody, please. If you don't want to listen, check them out. Honourable members, the guest of honour will be arriving shortly. Please rise. The guest of honour, His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Ghana, Nana Adodankwa Akufu Ado.
Please remain standing for the AU anthem, followed by the Ghana National Anthem.
Please be seated. Excellence, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Speaker of South Africa, may I invite into the chamber, uh, guided by Rule 38 1H, the following dignitaries. Some of them are already here. The Right Honorable Tandi Modise, Speaker of the South African National Assembly, who is already here. Uh, the Minister of the Department of International Relations, Honorable Aisha Mambo Adams, representing the Speaker of the Parliament of Malawi. Honorable Patrick Matibini, Speaker of the Zambian Parliament. His Excellency Bene Lofongo Mpoko, Ambassador of the Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo in South Africa. And also former office bearers in the Bureau of Pan African Parliament, those who were once presidents or vice presidents in Pan African Parliament. I won't mention by name because I may miss out one, but you are all invited to come into the chamber if you are sitting somewhere away from here. Honorable members, Your Excellency, we gather here this morning for the official opening, but before I do the formal uh, introductions, which in a way I've done by mentioning who is here, I would like to invite speakers who can deliver for us solidarity messages. And I'll start with uh, His Excellency, the Dean of our African Ambassadors, His Excellency Mpoko, the Ambassador of DRC in South Africa, to deliver a solidarity message. Thank you. Thank you, uh, the presiding officer who is acting now as a master of ceremonies. <laughs> Your Excellency, Nana Akufu Addo, our guest of honor, the President of the Republic of Ghana. The Right Honorable Tandi Modise, Speaker of the South African Parliament. Your Excellency, Dr. Naledi Pando, Minister of International Relations and Cooperations of the Republic of South Africa. Honorable Chief Sharumbira, the Acting President of the Pan-African Parliament. Honorable Delegates, members of the Diplomatic Corps, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Please allow me to take this opportunity to thank the Acting President of the Pan-African Parliament, Honorable Chief Fortune uh, Sharumbira, and the members of the Bureau for excellently steering the work of the Pan-African Parliament during their tenure. 
is an organ of the African Union Abuja Treaty. The Pan-African Parliament constitutes an ideal platform for all citizens of Africa, regardless of religious, race, and other consideration, to freely debate, discuss, through their delegates here present, all issues, problems, and challenges facing our continent today, and to propose viable and sustainable solutions. For instance, one of these challenges facing the continent today is the global pandemic called COVID-19 and its variants. The question is, we as Africans, what are we doing about it? Or are we just waiting for others to come to our rescue? Or are we prepared to take the bull by the horn and bring our scientists together in order to develop our own homegrown solutions? I think the choice is clear. Africa is blessed with the high-grade scientists who are either spread around the world or working right here on the continent. For instance, you are aware that the fiber optic, which is now the backbone of a digitalization all over the world, was invented by Dr. Thomas Menza, a citizen of Ghana. I'm sure you heard of young lady called Dr. Sandri Mubenga, a young DRC electrical engineer who, at a very tender age of 30, invented in the United States the hybrid electrical car. That's our sister from the continent who did that. She also invented and improved the performance of the electrical batteries which are currently used to power electrical vehicles. In 2018, she was declared Engineer of the Year in the United States. Speaking of electrical cars, of course, you know all about the Elon Musk, somebody who was born and raised right here in Pretoria. And you know what Tesla and his program of uh, SpaceX have done today. They have revolutionized the whole uh, area of automobile industry with the fabric, uh, manufacturing of the electrical cars. So those are African talents that I just named few to make the point that with respect to this COVID, we have scientists who can take it head on and come out with a vaccine for the continent of Africa. So we don't have to rely on the outside world. Mr. President, I think I'm borrowing your words that we need to be self-reliance on the continent. So going back to the coronavirus, as I said, I think we should bring all of our scientists who are scattered around the world and on the continent to come back and give them the means and the support that is required so they can come with the solution, especially so they can develop a, an African vaccine. Up to now, we are depending on outside the world for handouts, but these countries who have developed those solutions, they cater first to their own citizens before they can think of Africa. Your Excellency, dear delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I believe time has come for a Pan-African Parliament to move away from an institution that simply enacts model laws to a full-fledged legislative institution. We can achieve this goal by simply ratifying the 20 
14 protocol of the member states by the, by the simple majority of the member states. No, that's all it requires. Why can't we do it? Only then, if we achieve this objective, shall we have the path that we want. Furthermore, in order to have that path that we want, we also need to make and be conscious, uh, make a conscious effort to abandon some of our habits. What am I talking about here? I'm greatly disturbed when I hear our delegates arguing about who is Anglophone, who is Francophone, who is Lucifer. That's a thing of the past. Some even argue about who is from what region and so forth. The African region are important because there are structures of a dialogue and so forth. But those things should not divide us. No, they cannot divide us. So that when we walk into this hall, we must leave our divisions outside. Here we must act, talk, like one people, because we are Africans. I also would like to request, if it's possible, for all of us to collectively pledge that when we enter this chamber, we are here to solve the problems and the challenging facing our beloved continent, nothing else. And I would like to close these remarks by citing a well-known motto, which simply says, united we stand, divided we fall. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, the Dean of African Ambassadors, based in South Africa. I now call upon Honorable Aisha Mambo Adams, representing the Right Honorable Catherine Gotami Hara, of the Speaker of the Malawi Parliament. Our guest of honor, Your Excellency, the President of Ghana, Nana Akuf Ago, Honorable Chief Fortune Jurumbira, the Acting President of the Pan African Parliament, Dr. Naledi Pando, Minister of International Relations and Cooperation of the Republic of South Africa, Right Honorable Tandi Modise, Speaker of the South African National Assembly. Right Honorable Justice Dr. Patrick Matbini, Speaker of the Zambian Parliament, His Excellency Mohamed Yusuf Murphy, President of the Libyan Presidential Council, His Excellency Ben Lofongo Mpoko, Ambassador of the Democratic Republic of Congo in South Africa, esteemed members of the Pan African Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, Kunjan. It is with great honor that I stand before you, honorable colleagues, to convey a message of solidarity from the Parliament of Malawi on behalf of the Speaker of Malawi Parliament, Right Honorable Gotan Hara, who could not be with us today. The Right Honorable Speaker of the Parliament of Malawi has sent me with a message, a message of thanks for the invitation to grace the official opening of this session of the Pan-African Parliament. I therefore bring warm greetings from the Parliament of Malawi, the warm heart of Africa, Moribuanjinonsi. 
Honorable Acting President, the Bureau of the Pan-African Parliament and honorable members here present, many years ago, our forefathers had a dream, a dream that was inspired by the guest for independence for the African people. This dream was energized by the passion for the liberation of African countries from the whims of colonialism. That vision was achieved. However, it was not enough. The inadequacy of that vision to change the plight of the African people led our leaders to refine that area vision into a new direction premised on economic integration. That, honorable members, is the reason why we are here. Because any initiative towards development requires that the voice of those people that we endeavor to develop must be heard. That voice must form part of the narrative, shaping the direction of the economic, political, and cultural integration that the African Union seeks to achieve. This parliament, honorable acting president and honorable members, is the embodiment of that voice, the voice of the African people crying for improved livelihoods. This parliament must therefore be able to bring to bear the challenges and aspirations of the people we represent and work hard to ensure that appropriate solutions are found and implemented towards the achievement of the African Union shared vision, which is an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa, driven by its own citizens and representing a dynamic force in the global arena. Honorable Acting President and Honorable Members, this session is being held at an extraordinary time. First, because of the scourge of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has threatened to bring African economies to their knees. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the already existing vulnerabilities of African countries and is a threat to African integration, as well as democratic governance as countries shut their borders and impose strict in-country measures aimed at combating this disease. The pandemic has come at a time when Africa is already facing numerous challenges, such as peace and security, violent extremism, and effects of climate change, just to mention a few. These challenges have made it difficult for Africa to raise to the challenge. It is particularly disappointing that decades after independence, Africa could not manage to produce its own homegrown vaccine. This tells us that a lot needs to be done to achieve our African shared vision. And this parliament has a big role to play in that regard. Honorable acting president and honorable members, I am reliably informed that this session is being held at a time when the mandate of the Bureau and Bureaus of the Pan-African Parliament have expired. This presents this Parliament with a rare opportunity to energize, to re-energize itself and renew its imperials through the ushering in of a new leadership. I urge you, honorable members, to set aside narrow interests and embrace the spirit of Pan-Africanism as you usher in new leaders. Let the consideration for one to be elected to be only the abilities of the individual to propel this parliament towards its goals. That way, this parliament shall learn shall earn the trust of the African people and be able to take its rightful place in the governance of the African people. I have no doubt, honorable members, that you shall always work towards building a positive image of this parliament 
and make the people you represent proud. As I conclude, I notice from your program that you have set aside time to commemorate the African Day. The theme of the African Union for this year, which is the African Union Year of the Arts, Culture, and Heritage. Levers for building the Africa we want. This is particularly inspiring because for any sort of integration to happen, we must be alive to the beautiful diversity of our cultures and heritage. The recognition of the unity in our diversity is the first building block towards greater integration. The African Union theme gives you members of PAP and all of us an opportunity to reflect on what PAP could do in this area to preserve and promote the African heritage. Honorable colleagues, for PAP, as a continental parliament to effectively contribute to the African agenda, it has to operate as a legislature. Parliament of Malawi is aware that one of the challenges that this parliament is facing is the slow ratification of the Malawi Protocol to grant this institution legislative powers. But this should not discourage you to forge ahead. On this note, let me commend you, the leadership and members of Pan-African Parliament, for the tremendous strides made so far. But I wish to challenge you that more needs to be done. You can always count on the support of the Parliament of Malawi to the work you are doing and let less assured that the Parliament of Malawi stands with you. Ziko Mwambiri, Nyabonga, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. And I'll call upon the Right Honorable Justice Dr. Patrick Matibini, Speaker of the Zambia Parliament. Your Excellency and our guest of honor, Nana Kufu Ado, President of the Republic of Ghana, Honorable Chief Fortune Charambira, MP and Acting President of the Pan African Parliament, Right Honorable Tandi Modise, Speaker of the South African National Assembly. Right Honorable Asha Mambo Adams, Deputy Speaker of the Malawian Parliament, Her Excellency Dr. Nale Dipando, Minister of the Department of International Relations and Cooperation of the Republic of South Africa, His Excellency Beni Lofongo Mpoko, Ambassador of the Democratic Republic of Congo in South Africa, Honorable members of the Pan-African Parliament, distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor and privilege for me to address this August House on behalf of the National Assembly of Zambia, and indeed on my own behalf, I wish to pay special tribute to the Pan-African Parliament and congratulate you, Honorable Acting President, for convening this session amidst the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. I also wish to ex extend my sincere gratitude to the Government of the Republic of South Africa for hosting the Pan-African Parliament and this session in particular. Allow me to acknowledge the contribution of the Pan-African Parliament 
in championing peace and unity among African countries in line with the African Union vision of an integrated, prosperous, peaceful Africa driven by its own citizens and representing a dynamic force in the global arena. The Pan-African Parliament should be commended for fostering an environment that supports the realization of the African Union vision and the implementation of the Agenda 2063 themed the Africa we want. In this regard, the role of the Pan-African Parliament in creating awareness among the peoples of Africa regarding continental solidarity, cooperation, development, and promotion of peace, security, and stability on the African continent cannot be overemphasized. The years 2020 and 2021 have been unprecedented because the entire world grappled with the COVID-19 pandemic. Our continent and parliament have not been spared from this curve. However, the spirit of resilience and adaptability has enabled us to forge ahead. In the midst of the pandemic, the Zambian parliament has had to adjust the rules of procedure in order to safeguard lives and adhere to the COVID-19 guidelines. Thus, as a parliament, we've had to utilize virtual platforms for conducting parliamentary business. The ability to adapt to change has enabled our parliament to continue fulfill our legislative oversight and representative mandates. I'm therefore pleased to note that the Pan-African Parliament has also adopted the virtual mode of conducting business in order to continue fulfilling its mandates. This is also a mark of resilience and adaptability in the, mid in the midst of the pandemic. The unity displayed by the Pan-African Parliament members during the pandemic in ensuring that the flag of the continental body is flying is therefore highly commendable. I can only urge you, honorable members of this distinguished house to continue with the same spirit as we continue to forge the social, economic, and political agenda of the continent. Over the years, the Zambian parliament, through its delegation here, at Pan-African Parliament has been an active member of the Parliament. Our members have participated in statutory meetings, elections, of observer missions, and other missions of the continental body. As evidence of our commitment to the Pan-African Parliament, the Zambian Parliament in 2017 hosted the former president of the Pan-African Parliament, Honorable Roger Kondo Dang, who was on a mission to advocate for the ratification of the protocol on the Constitutive Act of the African Union relating to the Pan-African Parliament. Since then, the Zambian Parliament has been following up on the ratification of this protocol aimed at giving the continental body legislative powers. I therefore urge the Pan-African Parliament to continue its advocacy for the ratification of the protocol. The Zambian Parliament is also committed to enhancing the partnership with the Pan-African Parliament in order to foster democracy and good governance on the continent. In this regard, the Zambian Parliament will support the members of the Zambian delegation as they participate in Pan-African parliamentary statutory meetings and missions. Let me thank you once again for according me this opportunity 
to offer a message of solidarity this very seminal occasion. I wish you fruitful deliberations. I thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Say. At this juncture, may I formally welcome the guests of honor and the other dignitaries that are here in my speech. Your Excellency, Nana Ado Dankwa Akufo Ado, President of the Republic of Ghana, Right Honorable Tandi Modise, Speaker of the South African National Assembly, Honorable Dr. Naledi Panda, Minister of the Department of International Relations and Cooperation of South Africa, Right Honorable Justice Dr. Patrick Matibini, and the Speaker of the Parliament of Zambia, Honorable Aisha Mambo Adams, Deputy Speaker of the Parliament of Malawi, His Excellency Bene Lofongo Mpoko, Ambassador of the Democratic Republic in South Africa. Honorable members of Pan-African Parliament, members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the members of Pan-African Parliament and our Secretariat, I wish to welcome you, Your Excellency, the President of the Republic of Ghana, His Excellency Nana Akufo Ado, for accepting to be the guest of honor today at our occasion of the opening of our, our parliament after more than one year of no formal meetings. Your presence in this August House is a testimony of Ghana's commitment to the continental integration agenda and to the Africa we want. Allow me to also express our deepest gratitude to the people in the Republic of South Africa for the support that they continue to render to the Pan-African Parliament. It would be remiss of me if I do not commend our Secretariat for their sterling work which has enabled us to be here. It was not easy to put in place the relevant documentation and facilities under these COVID-19 circumstances. There was pressure, Your Excellency, that uh, we should not, and that was an instruction from the AU, that we should not hold a physical meeting as we are doing. But for practical reasons, we decided that we meet in this fashion. One of the reasons is that although we can conduct virtual meetings, Pan-African Parliament has no capacity at the moment to conduct hybrid meetings, and that is important. We are unable to conduct hybrid meetings, meaning we cannot have members of Parliament here, those that have not been able to attend, so that they can also follow and participate from elsewhere. We don't have that capacity. And more so, we had gone for more than a year with a lot of new members just to be, not, to be sworn in in Liberia and then I told you I'm a member of PAP, but you have never been to the actual premises. So it was important that we meet. And also the elections. The, if we do them through other means like uh, virtually, the confidence in the result may be... Uh, undermined. So we had to meet in this fashion, and this is a great day for us to assemble with you after such a long period. The Pan African Parliament, Your Excellency, comprises 270 MPs from the 54 member states, because one is not yet a member. Each delegation has five members of parliament with at least one woman, and also reflecting the political party composition of the national parliament. The objectives of the Pan-African Parliament are spelled out in the protocol establishing the Pan-African Parliament. And these include receiving reports from the AU organs to enable oversight processes, to discuss, discussing the budget of the African Union, making recommendations to accelerate the continental integration process, 
including now the African continental free trade area, which you host as Ghana. Promote the programs of the African Union in member states, promoting the harmonization of policies in member states, and last but not least, promoting human rights and good governance in the member states. Your Excellency, these objectives I've read out. I need not lecture to you. Can I, can I pause a bit? My dear, hello, hello, you are interrupting. You, this is a very important meeting. You are causing noise. What's happening? Can you please go out? Stop what you are doing. Can you stop what you are doing? Send the arms. Can you get him out? Yeah, you are interrupting. Sorry for that, Your Excellency. I was saying, I've read out the objectives of Pan African Parliament. Your Excellency, on the other hand, I feel I do not need to lecture to you as to what Pan African Parliament is and what the objectives were. Because you were one of those who sat to write down these objectives when you were the foreign minister then of Ghana in around 2000, 2004 at the launch. So, honorable members, we are sitting here with His Excellency, one of the authors and the brains behind Pan African Parliament. So, your presence today is very important that we raise the issue of um, how has this parliament then performed that you established when you are foreign minister. Yes, we have now existed. This is the 16th year. We have been involved in several activities covering all sectors across the continent, outside the continent. But we still believe we have still a long way to get there. We do have a number of challenges that are institutional. The vision itself, we don't believe it is well understood, even among other organs in the AU. Why Pan African Parliament? Why we need a parliament for the continent? There are some who don't think we may not need a parliament. We find that, and I want to use the word, a bit retrogressive, <laughs> because you cannot have a state architecture, a continental architecture that has no parliament to do the oversight and the other uh, constitutional responsibilities. The powers that we have, uh, that you gave us, Your Excellency, in 2004, which I've just read out here, that include uh, look, reviewing the, the, the budget of the AU, that has not happened yet, uh, Your Excellency. We are still fighting to do that, but we have not been able. Even the power to call reports from the AU, we do call them every session. Most of the times, we don't quite get the cooperation that a parliament should deserve. Your Excellency, the understanding of a parliament and this role in a continental nature will need to at least be shared more. Because of that, that lack of understanding, our budget, the budget of an African parliament, has suffered, has decreased more than 50% in the last four years. That is from 2017 when we were around 22 million annual budget. We are now on 11, half, in four years. And this budget, 11 million, means our committees, usually called the engine rooms of a parliament, cannot conduct business, cannot meet, cannot do fact-finding missions, in national parliaments, we do hearings. In our parliament, we do fact-finding missions. We have to travel to places to see, to see it for ourselves. We cannot rely on research by certain individuals as parliamentarians, and then we come and debate and advise. So on the budget front, it's really bad now. Your Excellency, 
the issue of the Malabo Protocol, the protocol that grants, will grant powers to this parliament to be legislative so that we have common operating ground in a number of areas as countries. And now with the continental, after continental free trade area, that is an imperative because we need to agree on a number of issues, movement of people, movement of goods, issue of visas, immigration, uh, transportation. You need a parliament like this one that then brings all issues and legislates. We are aware that some member states are not comfortable with legislative powers because they believe certain areas are sensitive, like security, military, and others. And we're not saying we want all those powers in a go. Okay, let's go for the soft ones, soft ones which really do not need much politics, like trading, buying and selling. We, these other more sensitive can follow or later, but a parliament should at least make some laws. Currently, even the Malabo Protocol, which we are saying, we are celebrating as giving us reserve powers. It's not giving us real reserve powers because it talks of model laws only. So we still have a long way to go. Your Excellency, I would not end the issue of institutional uh, challenges if I don't mention that even the issue of the parliament, the way it is structured in a number of areas, committee support, you don't have enough staff to do the research for particular committees. Of course, in addition to the problem of whether they can travel or, or be able to undertake fixed funding missions. Your Excellency, lastly, on that issue of um, enabling the parliament to perform, the members of parliament in, in, or members of PAP uh, have not been quite given an enabling conditions conditions that can make them be motivated to work, to do the extra seat as a parliamentarian. They belong to their national parliament. Now they leave their home. They travel long hours, they come to, to, to South Africa for two weeks or more. Surely, what are the conditions of work as a Pan-African parliament? At the moment, as I shared, and I want to say I shared, I briefed His Excellency last night when uh, he arrived. So I won't go into details as to what MPs of PAP uh, would want to see in terms of what I may call incentives. The President is aware, and I won't go into details of that. But anyway, despite these constraints, Your Excellency, your Pan African Parliament would still want to see, and is working very hard to ensure that every family, family on this continent has bread and butter on the table. That pregnant women give birth in safe hospitals. Young children go to school. Guns are silent. Human rights are respected and refugees treated with dignity. That women and girls are respected. Where women and men have decent children, where it's an Africa where women and men have decent jobs and salaries, to look after their families. This is the only way we can stop our youth from going into self-imposed slavery, our women from being trafficked all over the world, and our peoples from dying in the Mediterranean Sea, trying to illegally cross into Europe in search of greener pastures. Your Excellency, as a legislative arm of the African Union, the African Parliament wants to an integration of the Agenda 2063 into all our national and regional development plans. It is our firm belief that the Agenda 63 has the potential to uplift large numbers of our population out of poverty in fast track social, economic, and political transformation. We stand ready as Pan African Parliament to see the implementation of Agenda 2063. Allow me to briefly dwell on COVID-19 pandemic, which has wrecked havoc globally. Our people have endured extreme adversities, but have remained resolute. Many have died as a result of this courage. On that note, I wish 
to invite you to stand up. I wish to invite you to stand up so that we can observe a minute of silence in honor of the victims of COVID-19 epidemic. Thank you. Your Excellency, with respect to COVID-19 on the continent of Africa, I would like to commend our own Africa Center for Disease Control for their sterling effort in helping African countries to manage the pandemic. This is a clear demonstration that we can beat the pandemic if we remain united as a continent. It is imperative for the CDC to be strengthened in order to respond effectively to emergencies and complex health challenges facing our continent. But like the ambassador, the, the Dean of African Ambassadors mentioned, I think as we talk of COVID and the vaccines, let's also talk of what we as Africans have also discovered is a vaccine and also manufactured. We can't just be a market, a market for other people. This whole population, with all our scientists on the continent, with all our herbs and trees on the continent, with all the other knowledge that we have on the continent, why is it that we always talk of this from this country, that outside the continent, and I think that's a major challenge. And we need to think seriously about these issues. Your Excellency, this session has been organized to carry out too many, two tasks, election of the Bureau and bureaucracies and the adoption of rules that will enable the Pan-African Parliament to hold meetings virtually. And we believe that after this session, we will continue to build the unity of this continent. On the same lines that the Ambassador and Poco mentioned, Africa, because of colonial background, sometimes we are divided by the foreign languages that we speak. And this parliament should be the number one, the number one champion, and should walk the talk to ensure that this issue of this one talking this language or speaking this language is eradicated on the continent. It's dividing us unnecessarily. So as we move forward, we promise that this is a matter that, as a parliament, we will work very hard on and put a lot of energy on it. Otherwise, thank you very much for coming, Your Excellency. Um, on this note, may I call the Minister Excellency Dr. Naledi Panda, Minister of the Department of International Relations, and the cooperation of the Republic of South Africa to deliver a welcome message from the host country. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. To the uh, Acting President of the Pan-African Parliament, Honorable Chief Cherumbira, His Excellency, our Guest of Honor, President Nana Ado Dankwa Akufo Ado, President of the Republic of Ghana, the Speaker of the National Assembly of South Africa, Speaker Tandi Mudise, the Dean of the Diplomatic Corps in South Africa, Ambassador Mpoko, Ambassador of the Democratic Republic of Congo in South Africa, Honorable Representatives of the Pan-African Parliament, members of the Diplomatic Corps who join us this morning, representatives of civil society present here, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I feel deeply privileged and honored to have the opportunity 
to welcome you all to our country, the Republic of South Africa, for this special occasion, and to also wish you fruitful deliberations. I'm particularly honored to welcome one of my favorite presidents in Africa, President Nana Ado Dankwa Akufo Ado. Today marks yet another milestone as you open the fourth ordinary session of the fifth legislature of the Pan-African Parliament. I speak here with a sense of nostalgia. I am also one of the authors of the protocol, along with my colleague, the former speaker of the National Assembly of South Africa's Parliament, Dr. Freni Genuala, I was present in Libya when we began to put together the protocol that would result in the establishment of the Pan-African Parliament. I was much younger, much more beautiful then, uh, but I am part of that team. We were thrilled when during the African Union Assembly in Addis Ababa in July 2004, our heads of state and government agreed that South Africa should be the permanent seat of the Pan-African Parliament. <clears throat> Having been an author of the protocol, I thought I would become a member of the Parliament. However, sadly, I became a member of the executive in that year, and so I've never enjoyed this wonderful opportunity that you do. Since then, the government of South Africa has provided support to the Pan-African Parliament in line with the host country agreement. I wish to take this opportunity to assure you that as the government of South Africa, we are committed to continuing to provide support to the work of this important organ of our union, the African Union. In fact, currently, we are discussing the matter of the permanent seat and are deliberating upon purchase of the appropriate land site to begin to build the permanent seat of the parliament. Excellencies, as all honorable previous speakers have said, the past few months have been very difficult months and they have devastated us, particularly South Africa, but the world community, following the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic, which has claimed the lives of so many compatriots on our continent. The socioeconomic impact of this pandemic will be felt for quite some time. However, there are glimmers of hope, particularly as we observe many of our governments and leaders initiating the first steps of national vaccination programs. And I thank President Akufo Addo for Ghana leading in this regard. I'm pleased that we've also begun our vaccination program in South Africa, with hiccups here and there, as will happen all over. We have now begun with the second phase of our vaccination program, which is focused on people of 60 years and above, following our first phase of vaccination, which was that of health workers. I believe our continent will have to, in a very determined manner, address the worst effects of the pandemic for several years to come. Responding to it has not been easy. We've lost many people, as I said, and many of our key industries have been badly impacted. But I believe that as Africans, we will arrive at a point where we overcome this terrible pandemic. We have been warned 
that there will be other pandemics. It's a pattern of life we have to be ready for. And hence, I firmly agree with the acting president of the Pan-African Parliament that we as Africa must ensure we build the resilience to respond to any health threat confronting us as humanity. I also firmly agree with him that we must use our research and innovation capacity to develop these responses. We must rely on our human capital, our institutions, to develop this ability to respond actively. This means, as the Pan-African Parliament and as parliaments in our countries, we need to give more attention to what we are doing to invest in higher education, what we are doing to invest in intellectual capacity, what we are doing to build research and innovation institutions. Because if we cannot do that, then calling for Africa not to be dependent is merely to be rhetorical, to utter nice words, and not to change the fate of Africa. And it is only you, as parliamentarians, who can provide answers to those questions. Just as it is you who will provide answers as to whether we have good governance and democracy in Africa. Nobody else. You tolerate the abuses of the executive. No one else does. You permit the executive to run rushed over democratic institutions. It should not be the case if you were doing what we expected when the protocol was drafted. I think we must acknowledge the role that His Excellency President Cyril Ramaphosa played in helping us determine effective responses to this COVID-19 pandemic. And I was absolutely thrilled when His Excellency, our chair of the African Union, President Chisekedi, proposed that President Ramaphosa should continue the role he has played and serve as the African Union champion for our COVID-19 response. The President continues to work tirelessly together with the African Union Commission Chair and its Bureau to confront the challenges the continent is facing due to this threat. I hope, Excellencies, that at the conclusion of the deliberations of the Pan-African Parliament sitting, you will adopt a resolution supporting our fight that the WTO should temporarily waive the TRIPS protections which do not grant us access to the technology and the means to produce vaccines in the African continent, in countries that are able to produce them. This is something you must support South Africa and India on. We have put the proposal to the WTO. There is massive resistance to this opening up we're calling for because it suits many for us to be a customer. We are saying to them, we can produce and we want customers too. The reason for the existence, the raison d'etre, of the Pan-African Parliament is that we should have a platform for people from all countries on the continent to be involved in deliberations and decision-making on the problems and challenges that confront us. It's therefore my hope that you will exchange very focused and deliberate views on this important subject. Our public representatives should be the front line of leading Africa to greater autonomy. And they must actively support Africa in developing its capability to respond. As I said, we have made great strides. Actually, our continent has been quite amazing, which shows its caliber. 
despite predictions by many that we will be the worst hit. I don't know if you recall those public statements that there will be bodies of Africans lying on the pavement once this virus hits Africa. And here we are. While indeed we've been hard hit, particularly South Africa, but the doom and gloom that was presaged has not occurred. Of course, this mustn't make us complacent. For me, what it does is raise the scientific question of why have we not been as affected? What should we do to ensure it remains so and gets even better? I think we also need to focus on new challenges and new opportunities. Africa shouldn't only be about gloom and doom. It should be about the future. It should be about opportunities. I think one of the great opportunities lies in the decision of our Assembly of Heads of State and Government in February this year that our theme of the African Union for this year should be arts, culture, and heritage, levers for building the Africa we want. The endorsement of this theme affirmed aspiration five of Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. An Africa, as aspiration five says, with a strong cultural identity, with common heritage, shared values, and ethics. We anticipate that the programs and activities developed under this theme will allow African states to leverage important economic opportunities for growth that lie within the development, dissemination, and indeed consumption of African arts, culture, and heritage. I think there should also be clear evidence in this year and onward of a concerted effort to enhance the place of culture and heritage in articulating our common African identity. As one of the key organs of our union, it is thrilling that your agenda also focuses on this important theme. We believe arts, culture, and heritage can be a catalyst for employment creation, for new industry formation, and for income generation, particularly for women and youth, those most marginalized on our continent. However, we've not done enough to promote arts, culture, and heritage on the continent. For many decades, in fact, centuries, our continent has been the victim of the importation of practices and cultural mores from other regions of the world. And these have been shoved down our throat to the neglect of our own heritage. It's therefore high time that we promote our own wonderful culture and heritage and export it to other parts of the world. We also should join Senegal, Nigeria, Ghana, and Egypt in doing similar work that they are doing to create heritage institutions that reclaim our identity. We need to be more bold in claiming our space globally and leverage what we have to do this. There are many opportunities that could be taken up through music, through films, through dance, to name but a few cultural attributes. I believe as we focus on this theme, we should recall that thousands of our African cultural artifacts and symbols were stolen by former colonial powers primarily during the colonization era, but it goes on even today. Most of these artifacts are still displayed in foreign museums 
and many are refusing to release these artifacts to us. Effort and pressure from countries is required to ensure we repatriate these priceless gems, which are part and parcel of our heritage. Let me not get excited, Excellencies. Our guest of honor is going to excite us. I would like to conclude by commending the Acting President of the Parliament, the Honorable Chief Fortune Charumbira, for working tirelessly to ensure that the Parliament sits even during these difficult times of the pandemic. I wish you all productive and fruitful deliberations as you consider key issues that are impacting on our wonderful Africa. I also wish you all the best as you elect men and women of talent as the new members of the Bureau and as you set about the renewal of the leadership of other structures of this parliament, such, a, such as its permanent committees and uh, thematic caucuses. I wish to conclude by thanking the outgoing bureau with whom I had built a positive relationship. It didn't begin that way, but it ended well. Let me say, Excellencies, as I close, Asante sana. Merci beaucoup. Muito obrigado. Shukran. Nyabong. And I thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Naledi Panda. You were not excited, but you spoke a lot of good things. And uh, you are not yet old, because your speech could demonstrate that uh, you are still of a very sound mind, very energetic. Half of the time, you are not even reading, you are speaking from your, your heart. So we still classify you as young. Uh, and, and it's still beautiful minister. Things have not changed. Uh, don't worry. I had comments when you say my face. I had two comments. Said, you are still beautiful. So I'm just repeating what came from the floor. And uh, you said... His Excellency, the President here of Ghana, is your favorite president, or one of your favorite president. I also want to say his presence here demonstrates that. That is effective. But the Honorable Members, last night I did make a comment to the, His Excellency, the President. He impressed me in one thing. He, the Ghana delegation at PAP, joined us at, uh, okay, where I, he is residing temporarily. And when the delegation of five arrived, and the, the president knew each member by name, each member by name, that is Joseph also, Muntaka, Collins, is, I, I could not hide my excitement. I said to him, Your Excellency, you are a real true leader of the people. Because most of presidents don't know they are MPs. How come you know your MPs? This is very good. I want to commend you for that. And I'm very excited. I now call upon the Right Honorable Tandi Modise, Speaker of the South African National Assembly to deliver a message a former two, three years ago was a member of Pan-African Parliament. Thank you. The acting president of the Pan-African Parliament, the Honorable Chief Chirambura, Your Excellency Nana Ado Dangwa Akujo Ado, the president of the Republic of Ghana, Mena Lady Pando, Minister of International Relations and Cooperation in my country. 
Your Excellencies, Speakers, Deputy Speakers, and other presiding officers, Ambassador Mpoko, and all the other ambassadors here present, former members of the Bureau, members of the Pan-African Parliament, ladies and gentlemen. We are grateful to be here today. As you begin with your official fourth ordinary session in this, your fifth Pan-African Parliament. We join those who bow their heads in sorrow because multitudes of Africans and other peoples across the world have died because of the coronavirus. We note in particular the deaths not only in the National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces of South Africa, but also in the provinces and in the local government of public representatives. And we know that across the continent and across the world, public representatives have died as much as the people they represent have also died from this. We note that the pandemic has actually opened our eyes to the disparities that continue to exist between us as the former oppressed, between us as the former colonizers and the colonized, sometimes between us as those who were colonized, between these boundaries that were set between us. We also have seen how the coronavirus has affected women and children in the rural areas specifically. And those of us who have inherited areas of informal settlements, we know how hard hit those areas are. Now, it is important for us to begin as public representatives to internalize the impact of the coronavirus on all of us but to also specifically note that the pandemic has also increased the general exposure for women towards gender-based violence and femicide. Unfortunately, it is what it is that when those who control the purse strings, those who are seen as the heads of families, when the finances are hit, that the vulnerable ones in the household, in the communities, take the pity. So we also acknowledge that there are undesirable ramifications of this persistent virus. But we cannot panic. We know that when we do unite as Africans, we will beat this thing. And when we beat this thing, we will begin to rebuild our economies. We will regain our cultures, our identities. We will regain our love for music. We will remember who we were, even when the memories of old have been wiped out. Honorable members, we must remember that tomorrow, we celebrate Africa Day. That much towards the dismantling of colonialism and slavery. Except that we didn't really dismantle slavery and colonialism. Because those who have stood here before me remember, and I remember my short stint in this house, just how the former colonizers' languages divide us as this house. That, honorable members, must stop. It is not the languages that must define us. It is what we stand for as public representatives. Um, we are here because our people believed in us. They voted for us. We went into parliaments. We were correctly then sent to these institutions to represent. Our people believe that we represent them because we care. 
We represent them because we've got hearts and minds. We represent them because we are honest and we'll do what is right, not only to those who are within our borders, but to those who are across this continent. And therefore, it is important for us that we begin to remember that if the Pan-African Parliament unites, if the Pan-African Parliament begins to rotate its elections as it should, because that is the other weakness this House has, that rotation of the leadership of this House, which has been recognized by all that we stand for at the AU, is not happening in this House. So we want to say that it is time. It is time that we recognize that unity is not just because we show might, we show wealth, we show how we can speak. Unity is sometimes you reducing your pace to the slowest amongst us. You accepting that all of us need to get to where all of us must get because the end game is about unifying, it is about building relations, it is about building people, and therefore building the economy of Africa. It is about recognizing that we are not just handbags as women. It is about recognizing that the young people of Africa are ready to take their places and their spaces in this house. It is about recognizing that until we open up, until we recognize our weaknesses, that we're not going to change, that we will have rounds and rounds of democratization of this continent and fail each time because we are divided by that which we inherited from our colonizers. And therefore, I want to say that we need to start thinking as Africans. We need to start thinking as brothers and sisters. We need to start building this continent. And I keep on asking, what is it that we don't have in Africa? Um, Ambassador Mpoko, whatever it is that it takes the world to produce this connectivity, the minerals are where? Are in the DRC, are in Brazzaville, are in South Africa, are everywhere in our continent. They are mined and sometimes they are stolen because we get distracted of being enticed into civil unrest, being enticed into having quarrels with neighbors instead of holding hands and building. Why do you think that you continuously need to buy from the other continents what you wear? Your best designers, honorable members, are Cameroonian and Ghanaians. Your best producers of material is still Senegal and Nigeria. But my favorite, Speaker Matibini, is the best tie and dye is still from Zambia. So what do we need? Why is it that I want to be defined by somebody else's culture? Why do I want to reclaim my identity but still smudge it and coat it with somebody else's identity? What do I say to my great-grandchild one day? No, it was fashionable to jettison the African heritage. It was good to look and to speak otherwise. And I've not seen other continents adopting our cultures. I have seen Africans dumping their cultures for others. So I would say that it is important for us as we commemorate, as we celebrate, as we think of our foremothers who started the Pan-African Women's Organization. By the way, it came before the OAU. That, in fact, our foremothers began to understand that without the unity of Africans, there would not be an Africa to live for their children. That when the OAU came in, it was to solidify the thoughts that may not have um, been solid from our mothers to begin to build together that which we must hand over to future generations. So for me, 
When we celebrate Africa Day tomorrow, we must say no to continued gender-based violence. We must say no to gender discrimination. We must say no to racial and even ethnic discrimination. We must say no to I am better because I'm within the South African boundaries and you because you are across the borders are nothing. Because without my neighbor across the border, I am nothing. We are proud because we are looking at the Africa Free Trade um, President. And we are excited as South African women because our studies show that across the borders, those small traders, those people who make us understand our languages and cultures are women who must now be affirmed through this Africa firm, uh, free trade. We are proud because finally I don't have to go to Lagos to buy that suit my brother. I will be able to see more and more legit businesses across. And what we should be stealing ourselves from is to talk about Honorable Minister, what other jurisdictions do about enabling members of regional and continental parliaments to do. That passport we should enable members of the Pan-African Parliament, members of SADC, to be able to go across as and when their committees send them. So we put in that as the National Assembly to you, Minister, to make sure that we do not have members who are unable to attend because the visas are not available. Members who are unable to rush through into Lesotho because there is something that needs to be looked at by members of, we want to make sure that that trust that the people give us, that those who can give us the means to enable us to go and do that which is important, they give us. We, we must stand because we respect the peace that we think we have. We must stand and be counted with those who do not experience peace. We must, as this parliament, be able to stand very firmly and say, it is enough. We shall not tolerate internal displacements of people. We shall not see our children trafficked. We shall not see people across the world selling our daughters as though they have no futures. We must say that we do believe that we are able to stand up and be counted with the people of Mozambique for peace. We must be able to say Ethiopia, Chad, Nigeria, Somalia, Sudan, the DRC, Mali, amongst all of this, we stand with you. We stand with you against violence. We don't take sides. We want to see positive relations within countries because they are important for any person to think and to develop. We want to say that in the same vein, we stand very firmly with the people of the Western Sahara. Because what they do ask for is simple coexistence and self-determination. Therefore, we stand with them. Over the last few days here in South Africa, we have seen horrifying pictures of Palestinian children and women being shot at. We stand against this. We want to see the peace that we speak about in our own homes, in our streets, in our communities being extended to the child, to the woman, to the ordinary man, both in Palestine and in Israel. Because where we stand, solutions must be found. Where we stand, 
We cannot have peace in one part of the world and watch on and let other people be killed. So for me, it is important that as a Pan-African parliament, as we do intend, uh, Honorable Chief Whip of the majority in the National Assembly, we do intend to go to Palestine. We do intend to give solidarity. But our trip to Palestine will not exclude a visit to Israel. Because it is important that parliamentary diplomacy is seen for what it is, to unite, to fix, to push forward for progressive energy for future. We want to join you, Minister Pando. We cannot allow the continuation of the haves versus the have-nots, even in death. And therefore, we stand firmly against vaccine apartheid. So we want to say, whatever it is that needs to be done, we must stand with our governments to ask for that, to call for that, to advocate for that. We join hands as Africans to look at the disparities of income gaps, to look at faltering economies in the continent. We are much weaker when one country is dependent wholly on a foreign donors to run its own affairs. It is almost like we mortgage our souls when somebody else foots our, our budgets, because then the old thing of the piper comes into play. We want to say that for us as Africans to begin to consider ourselves as equal human beings under the sun, we need to begin to act like that. We need to recognize and to respect that we are equal. I am a rural girl. I've never felt inferior to anybody in the world because I do not think that anybody is, bu is built like a car to be superior than the other. We are born the same way. We need to respect the spaces that we need to get into. So I want to say that we must unify this house in doing that which is good. We must lessen the disagreements. We must be able to listen to arguments from any country or any region of Africa without descending into acrimony. We must be able to respect all the languages and all the cultures. We must be able to move so that we do what Mepando says we must do, hold our executive to account. We fail dismally to do so because in the short stint I spent here, this house was not united. This house, we actually, as South Africa, had issues even about the rules of the house. So we would like to say that which Chief Chirambura, you are talking about, the gaps in the administration, like we are beginning to do at the SADC PF, where other countries second whatever skills they think we need to tighten up that regional uh, uh, forthcoming parliament of ours. We must begin to then look as countries of Africa whether we cannot see the gaps and second for, for us to ensure that that research which we are told is lacking is strengthened. And therefore, begin to be taken seriously because we take ourselves seriously. We, as South Africa, we will be looking at is the 25 years of our constitution. This constitution of ours has enabled me to stand here proudly because overnight I was recognized not just as a human being, but as an equal woman and child, as a person who can speak any language because there is no superior language in South Africa. As a person who comes from any corner of South Africa, because it does not matter where you come from, it applies the same way. Because I can now have access to education, 
my grandchildren will be better than me. They will have better access to education because suddenly there is no culture, no custom, no tradition that is inferior to any. Because I am not just because I'm lighter or darker. And most importantly, nobody judges me because I am female or male or anything in between. And therefore in this country, we even celebrate the different sexual orientations and choices that South Africans make. Because we did not make them, the makers did, and therefore it is important. We respect religions. We respect everybody who comes into our country and do that. And we want to say that in the last few years, South Africa, and in Dadenbogo, you'd probably remember that I addressed the ambassadors in South Africa in Cape Town some two years ago on the issues and the accusations that South Africa was becoming xenophobic. We will not tolerate xenophobia in South Africa. We will not tolerate any human being being treated differently. What we shall not tolerate also is criminality, whether it is by the nationals or the extra nationals within our borders. We will respect the laws and we will protect anybody and everybody within the borders of South Africa. Chief Chirambura, I wish you well, my brother. I hope that the rest of this sitting goes well. I hope that you have very fruitful deliberations. And I hope that uh, we will be able to unite in such a way that um, we move forward. Um, President, um, I have been listening to you on TVs. I have even been reading your speeches. I'm very happy that today I have physically met you. Because Ghana has a special place in our hearts. Nigeria has a special place in our hearts. Hell, which part of Africa have we not been uh, staying in? Almost all of Africa. And therefore, if you look at South Africans, you see us as those who think we belong to Africa and Africa belongs to us. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, as I mentioned, the Speaker of the South African National Assembly, Right Honorable Tandy Modi, is a former member of Pan African Parliament. And now she's a speaker. Uh, when she left, we lost two, herself and another, who were given other assignments. There was also Honorable Tokodi Diza, who became Minister of Agriculture in South Africa. I am making saying these things because I want to be present to know that this, this parliament is made of very highly competent persons that are appointed this parliament. Very highly qualified, experienced, people of high caliber. And you see the delivery that, look, surely this is not a parliament for the mediocre. It can deliver. And uh, Excellency, we produce ministers here in a year people that, that are appointed to the executive from this parliament, in a year, not less than 10 are appointed in every year because of the capacity that we have in this parliament. We, some have become heads of state from this parliament. The current president of Namibia, the former, former president of Ghana, the past president of Mali, the current president of Seychelles, some I may have forgotten. I'm simply saying uh, this is a parliament that is made of very uh, competent people. Help us, help us 
to effectively perform. All we need are uh, an environment that is very supportive, especially from the African Union, to enable such competent people to perform. Because without being enabled in an enabling environment, PAP will continue to be viewed as a parliament that is not performing to its standard. But if you look at the quality, it means no. The people are there of high caliber. And how come they are appointed ministers? So how can PAP be said not to be effective? And they become ministers, they become very effective. And how come some of them become heads of state? It means it's a serious parliament. Um, uh, it's the turn for the guests of honor, but I've, I'm waiting for some. Now they are disappointed. They're letting me down because I thought they were coming to clean up here. Uh, we have done it? Yeah. Thank you. Let me take this opportunity, honorable members of Pan African Parliament, your excellencies, other invited guests, that as I call upon the guests of honor, His Excellency Nana Ado Dankwa Akufo Ado, to deliver his speech, I also call upon you to rise. Thank you, thank you again. Take your seats. Thank you. Acting President, Honorable Members, I'm deeply honored by this privilege to address the fourth ordinary session of the fifth parliament of the Pan African Parliament. And I'm grateful, Acting President, for your invitation to do so. And I thank honorable members for coming in your numbers to listen to me at this opening ceremony, COVID-19 notwithstanding. I acknowledge with gratitude the presence of the Right Honorable Speaker of the South African National Assembly, South Africa's Distinguished Minister for the Department of International Relations and Cooperation, Right Honorable Speakers and Representatives of Parliaments of Member States of the African Union, and the Dean and Members of the Diplomatic Corps. It is entirely appropriate that the Pan-African Parliament should be located in South Africa, a country that has been in recent decades the bedrock of democratic consolidation on the African continent and the birthplace of Africa's greatest fighter for freedom and democracy, Nelson Madiba Mandela. May his soul continue to rest in perfect peace in the bosom of the Almighty until the last day of the resurrection when we shall all meet again. Amen. Acting President, Honorable Members, I had the honor to have been part of the birth of the Pan-African Parliament in 2004, some 17 years ago, when I was the then Foreign Minister of Ghana in the administration of His Excellency John Ajikun Kufo, the second President of the Fourth Republic of Ghana. We had very high hopes for the growth of this institution to act as a continental parliament within the African Union to promote the democratic aspirations of the African peoples. Acting President, I've taken note of the important concerns you've expressed about the functioning of the House. And I'm aware the plans are on course for the Bureau of the PAP and the Bureau of the PRC to meet soon to address these concerns. I know that within the AU structure, ultimately, these concerns will also be addressed by the Assembly of Heads of State and Government of the Union, where I will have the opportunity to have my say. So I'll hold my peace until then. But we'll take this opportunity.
to thank the people and government of the Republic of South Africa for their continuing support for the operations of the Pan-African Parliament. Acting President, Honorable Members, I find myself very much at home here with you, having been for 12 consecutive years a Member of Parliament for the Abuakwa and Abuakwa South constituencies in the eastern region of Ghana. Indeed, some of the most interesting times of my political life were in the Chamber of Parliament. And dare I say, that is where, with the help of colleagues, we did some of the work with long-lasting effect on the Ghanaian nation. I must admit that I do sometimes miss Parliament, especially the vigorous debates that ensued between members of both sides in Ghana's dynamic parliament. But I believe none of you here would begrudge me if I told you I prefer the position of president for obvious reasons. <laughs> Acting President, honorable members, in our respective countries, we often underestimate the importance of parliament and consequently undermine its work. We cannot emphasize enough the role of Parliament in exercising the checks and balances needed on the executive. We cannot emphasize enough the role of Parliament as the voice of the people. And we cannot exercise in, emphasize enough the role of Parliament in setting the tone of public discourse in the country. It is for the good of our countries the parliaments on the continent develop the capacity to insist on accountability in all aspects of our lives, especially in our governance. For no institution is better suited to do this than the one composed of the representatives of the people. I am a strong believer in the work of parliament. And as we strive to deepen continental integration, and strengthen ties that exist, exist between our respective countries. We should create room for our respective parliaments to learn from each other, and through that process, enhance the prospects of continental integration. It is one of the best ways to realize the objects of Agenda 2063 and help create the Africa we all want for in our time. Acting President, honorable members, the African Union has chosen arts, culture, and heritage, levers for building the Africa we want, as its theme for the year, which is extremely commendable. A continent is divine, defined by many things. It is defined by its history to an extent. It is defined by its geography to an extent. It is defined by its economy to an extent. It is defined by many other things. However, nothing defines a continent more than the arts, culture, customs, heritage, and tradition in its traditions. Aspiration five of Agenda 2063, which see, quote, an Africa with a strong cultural identity, common heritage, shared values, and ethics, unquote, enjoins us to promote the history, identity, heritage, and consciousness of African peoples and their diaspora. It further encourages us to tap into Africa's rich heritage and culture to ensure that the creative arts are major contributors to Africa's growth and transformation. Even whilst we are proud of our history, our culture, and our arts, we must recognize the forces of change and modernization that are knocking insistently on our doors. Too often, modernization has been seen as synonymous with westernization. But modernization is not necessarily the same as westernization. As the experiences of the Asian tigers have shown, nations can modernize in their own way borrowing from outside whilst maintaining the essentials of their own culture. Today, Japan, for example, is a very successful modern nation, but it is not Western. The success or failure 
of our modernization will be determined largely by how well we preserve what is good about our culture whilst modifying the aspects that no longer suit our needs. As we dedicate this year to the promotion of Africa's arts, culture, and heritage, against the background of increasing global expression of interest and investments in the sector, we should use the occasion to promote the patenting of Africa's creative designs to protect intellectual property, folklore, and traditional knowledge, and adopt other methods to protect us against counterfeiting and piracy. The Africa we want may never be realized if we turn our backs on our cults, culture, customs, and heritage. Furthermore, to re-echo South Africa's foreign minister, we must intensify our efforts at retrieving our looted cultural treasures, which are being housed in the museums of the nations that stole them from us, and making money for, for them instead of for us. Come what may, whatever the obstacles, we must get them back. And come. I encourage all others to emulate the laudable examples of those countries which have committed themselves to the process of restoration. To this end, I had the honor two weeks ago to cut the sword for the construction of a Pan-African World Heritage Museum near Winneba in the central region of Ghana, which is intended to house artifacts and cultural objects from all parts of the Pan-African world. When it opens its doors to the world, it will be a major contributor to our ability to imbibe a deep consciousness of the ideals and goals of Pan-Africanism. Acting President, Honorable Members, the overarching vision of Agenda 2063 is to transform Africa, quote, into the global powerhouse of the future, unquote. Whilst our numbers make us formidable in the world, and we possess the requisite resources, human and natural, needed for progress and prosperity, we still have some way to go towards realizing the objects of this noble agenda. Indeed, the realities confronting our respective countries are those of guaranteeing accelerated sustainable development, the effective integration of our economies into the high end of the global value chain, the eradication of poverty and inequality, and the marginalization of our nations. If we are to succeed in these endeavors, our best bet is to be united. The off-cited Ghanaian proverb, one broomstick on its own can be easily broken, but put together cannot be broken should be our guiding principle. The threats of climate change, the phenomenon of illegal mass migration, and the scourge of armed conflicts, terrorism, and violent extremism can be met head on and defeated if we act together. One thing the pandemic of COVID-19 has taught all of us is that we must hasten the process of regional and continental integration because acting together will boost our capacity to succeed. From our inability to make our own diagnostic tests, to the scramble for vaccines, and to the shocks our respective economies have suffered, resulting in a recession on the continent, it is obvious that we need each other, and more so in combating the COVID-19 pandemic. We must encourage South Africa, Rwanda, Senegal, Ghana and others to develop the capacity to produce our own vaccines so that we can more effectively deal with future pandemics and not be dependent on foreign supplies and benevolence for the protection of our peoples. It, it is the accelerated economic integration of committed nations on the continent that will breathe new life into the African Union and develop the, deliver the benefits of African integration to the doorsteps of the African peoples. One critical instrument for the realization of this 
is the African Continental Free Trade Area, whose trading commenced on 1st January. Ghana has had the good fortune to be awarded the honor of hosting the Secretariat of the AFCFTA. Acting President, honorable members, we have always lamented the low volume of trade between the co countries on the continent, which currently stands at some 16% of our combined GDP. And yet we all know that this is one of the areas in which we have to improve if we are to make progress in bringing prosperity to our peoples. Intra-regional trade in the European Union, for example, stands at 75% of theirs. It is my belief that the operation of the AFCFTA, comprising a market of some 1.2 billion people, with a combined GDP of 3 trillion United States dollars, marks a seminal moment in changing the way business is conducted among our nations. It provides the vehicle for us to trade amongst each other in a more modern and sophisticated manner and will give us protection on how we deal with other trading blocks. We in Ghana are very happy to host the Secretariat and we look forward to serve as the instrument through which doors are open for African nations to trade with each other and remove the barriers that currently limit our interactions. It is unacceptable that young African entrepreneurs would instinctively look to Europe for openings, whereby nearby Ghana or Nigeria or Senegal or Kenya or South Africa might provide a better market and vice versa. I'm sure you do not know that the best chocolates in the world, bar none, are produced in Ghana, but then we also do not know all your hidden secrets. Acting President, honorable members, it is time to get to know each other, to visit each other, to learn from each other, and if need be, to criticize each other and look out for each other. It is time, my dear brothers and sisters, for us to transform our countries and bring prosperity to our peoples. We cannot continue to live in the continent as the majority of what is left of the world's remaining minerals, and yet has the poorest people in the world. We should not have rich oil fields that make millionaires and billionaires of outsiders, whilst too many of our peoples live in abject poverty. Every time the talk, talks, the, the talk turns to poverty on our continent, my thoughts go to the report of the committee chaired by the eminent South African statesman, the former president of South Africa, His Excellency Thabo Mbeki, which shows the amount of wealth that is illegally siphoned out of Africa systematically, estimated on the average to be presently 80 billion United States dollars a year. Then I can see that people will continue to make money out of our resources when we have not developed the expertise needed to exploit these natural resources ourselves. What is unconscionable, however, is that we continue to take monies from our countries into these developed countries when we should be spending the money developing our own countries. It is time to marshal our combined voices and say Africa deserves better and Africans should not take part in impoverishing our continent and her peoples. The importance of us establishing a solid foundation for the progress and prosperity of the continent is born out of the fact that by 2050, Africa will be home to a quarter of the world's population. She will have more than half of the working age population and potentially have a GDP of some 29 trillion United States dollars. It is obvious that we have a major contribution to make to the growth of world civilization and global stability a stability that will reflect our determination to preserve the integrity of our environment and respond with urgency to combat successfully the effects of climate change. We have it within us, within our power, to transform our economies and bring prosperity to our peoples. 
Let us join together to make it possible within our, our generation. And let us work together towards fulfilling in our time the Pan-African dream of a united Africa, which was so eloquently articulated by Ghana's first president, Kwame Nkrumah, in the early years of independence. Tomorrow, 25th May, is Africa Day. May God bless Mother Africa and us all. Acting President, honorable members, I thank you very much for your attention. I wish you successful elections and fruitful deliberations. Excellency, the thunderous applause and response to your speech demonstrates that the choice of uh, guests of honor was the best for the occasion. It is uh, the culture of African practice that when you receive an important person like yourself who then it delivers and leaves you with a message that we will all take back to our national parliaments and home, that you show appreciation by giving some souvenirs. So we'll do that just now. Honorable members, this will be your first gift. This is your first gift to the to His Excellency, the President of Ghana. You see two flags: PAP, an African Parliament flag, and the flag of Ghana. This is to say to Ghana, through His Excellency that we are very grateful as Pan-African Parliament. Ghana ratified and deposited the instruments of the Malabo Protocol on the 25th of January 2019. So this is an expression of gratitude by our Parliament to you, Your Excellency, that uh, you walk, you walk your talk. You walk your talk because a number of heads of state, they go everywhere, they, they sign, they sign, they sign the protocols. When it comes to ratification, they get scared. <laughs> the same document that they sign, now can you ratify, they get scared. So you, when you sign, you are serious. Okay? So thank you very much. We then hand over this to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, a second, so I just want to, to show them. So I can see. 
this uh, the map of Africa and the Pan African Parliament logo inscribed here. And I want to read what is written. It's written, presented to His Excellency Nana Ado Dankwa. I want to move closely. Nana Dankwa Ado, President of Ghana, by Honorable Chief Shalom Bilating President of the African Parliament, 24 May 2021. Now, Africa map with the islands is a message to you that continue, continue being African President and uh, keep building the continent. We, I'm uh, sometimes free when I meet people like you. You see, we have heads of state, but their minds are in Europe, not in Africa. <laughs> you just say, please, you are a president in this, on this continent. You rose up because of this continent. Please uh, make sure you work for this continent. And then this other, uh, the, the inscription of our Pan African Parliament. It's a message to say, don't forget PAP. Don't forget about African Parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just announced it. It's not announced to At this juncture, Your Excellency, we really have come to the end of the program. Yes, we've come to the end of the program, and uh, the bureau, I've, I've the bureau, I found it very befitting. I found it very befitting to invite for to, to deliver the vote of thanks a founding member of this parliament, who was a member of parliament, who was a vice president in the bureau 2004 to 2009. She's currently the chair of the Central Caucus. Madam, we all know her, Madam Loom. Madam Loom, can you please come and deliver the vote of thanks? Excellence, Monsieur Nana Ado Danko Akufo Ado, Président de la République du Ghana, invité d'honneur du pape à cette quatrième session. Mesdames et Messieurs, en vos rangs, grades et qualités, chers collègues députés, je prends la parole au nom du Parlement panafricain pour prononcer un mot de remerciement à l'honneur de notre invité d'honneur. Monsieur le Président, vous avez accepté de répondre à notre invitation dans un contexte particulier de la pandémie de COVID-19, malgré votre agenda très chargé. Cette réponse que vous apportez à cette invitation témoigne de l'engagement que vous portez non seulement au Parlement panafricain, mais à l'Afrique tout entière. Et votre présence parmi nous est d'un réconfort considérable. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Et c'est du plus profond de notre cœur qu'après un an et demi sans activité fondamentale, vous nous retrouvez ici pour célébrer l'ouverture de cette session. Il vous souviendra tous ici, surtout pour ceux qui étaient présents à Addis Abeba en mai 2004, nous avons encore en mémoire le rôle fondamental joué par le dynamique jeune ministre de l'époque, des affaires étrangères du Ghana, qui avait porté le pape dans les fonds baptismaux avec tant d'autres, sous le leadership du président de la commission Konaré et du président de l'Union en son temps, M. Tissano. Merci beaucoup, Excellence. Monsieur le Président, nous sommes très touchés par votre message que vous venez de prononcer, ce message d'un sens très profond. Et ce discours nous interpelle tous 
et va nous servir de feuille de route. Monsieur le Président, en Afrique, on ne parle pas trop pour dire merci à un frère. Vous avez trop fait pour le continent. Vous avez des lourdes charges également pour l'Afrique. Le président vient de vous dire, continuez à penser au pape. Merci beaucoup et nous vous demandons de continuer à regarder le pape avec un bon regard. Merci, monsieur le président. Thank you, Honorable Madame Lum. Before we adjourn, uh, listen to this very important announcement. When we break, we'll, we'll come back about 3.30 to give enough time for lunch. And um, we'll continue with the swearing in ceremony for those, for those uh, countries that have not taken oath. And just to make sure that the countries are not late, don't be late. We'll start with Mali, followed by Mauritania, Mozambique, Namibia, Niger, Nigeria, Rwanda. I'll end there for now. So these countries, these delegations, don't be late. Uh, by 3.30, uh, Mali, Mauritania, Mozambique, Namibia, Niger, Nigeria. The House is now adjourned for lunch, and we'll be back at 3.30. I thank you. <laughs>